Hi, my name is Social Professor Victoria Manning from Monash University and Turning Point. So in this symposium on cue-based interventions, my talk will be on cognitive bias modification during alcohol withdrawal, presenting some result, results from a multi-site or blind randomised control trial. And this form of cognitive bias modification is targeting approach bias, a tendency to automatically approach rather than avoid alcohol cues. And in Australia, like most places in the world, alcohol remains the number one reason for seeking addiction treatment. In fact, a large prospective treatment outcome study in Australia showed that despite this, alcohol patients achieve the poorest outcomes compared to patients seeking treatment for other drugs. Unfortunately, and the literature suggests, 85% will relapse within a year of leaving detox. And we often see this happening in the first few weeks, if not the first few days. Only minority tend to go on for residential rehab. Most are referred for outpatient counselling, but we know that the uptake of that counselling and the effectiveness of that tends to be diminished once heavy drinking has resumed to its pre-admission levels. So we have a situation where they're leaving a highly protected detox environment and returning to a community where they're bombarded by these alcohol cues, which trigger craving and ultimately relapse. So we were really interested in whether we could apply approach bias modification as an adjunctive treatment during the acute withdrawal phase to really protect or against early relapse during that vulnerable period as they transition from residential to community treatment. So a few years ago, we ran a double blind pilot RCT with 83 patients undergoing an alcohol withdrawal, a seven to 10 day program. And they were randomized to receive either four consecutive days of ABM or a sham training control condition where they were responding to two sets of neutral stimuli. And we found that rates of continued abstinence at the two week follow up were significantly higher, 30% higher in the ABM group if they did all four training sessions and 22% higher with an intention to treat approach where we looked at the outcomes of those who'd completed at least one training session relative to the sham train controls. In this task, we use an, uh, an irrelevant feature on the ABM where they're instructed to push forward on a joystick when they see images with a portrait frame, which simulates a avoidance movement. And on 95% of trials, the portrait frame will contain an alcohol image. And they're told to pull on the joystick when they see an image with a landscape frame simulating an approach movement. And on 95% of the trials, a landscape frame will contain a non-alcoholic image. So with funding from the National Health and Medical Research Council in Australia, we set out to replicate the findings of our pilot trial in a large, fully powered, multi-site, double-blind, randomised control trial, this time with 300 participants from four different withdrawal units in Melbourne. Participants completed a series of baseline measures, which included this time a measure of approach bias, as well as alcohol dependence and craving. They then did four consecutive days of training again during their seven to 10 day detox, but this time sham training controls will respond to the same alcohol and non-alcohol images and were instead making lateral movements on the joystick in response to the picture frame. So there was no approach or avoidance training for that group still. The primary outcome was again, continuous abstinence at the two week post discharge follow up where we managed to speak to 91% to establish outcomes and these these data have now been published. But we also did telephone follow-ups at three, six and 12 months post-discharge and these data are currently being written up for publication. In terms of the demographic and clinical characteristics, these are pretty typical of what we see in, in patient withdrawal settings. We had 58% 58, uh, 58 of the sample were male and the mean age was 44. In terms of their clinical characteristics, they had moderate to severe alcohol use disorder on the SCID5 high scores on the severity of alcohol dependence scale, very heavy alcohol consumption. Almost all of them were, were daily drinkers and they were drinking around 20 standard drinks a day, as well as high rates of comorbidity, smoking and previous uh, inpatient admissions. But importantly, there was no significant group differences on either these demographic or clinical characteristics between the ABM and the sham training control group. So again, we took a, a conservative approach and assumed anybody lost to follow up had relapsed. And with ITT intention to treat, including those who had completed at least one session, we found a significant difference where abstinence was 12% higher in the ABM group than it was in the sham group. 
However, with per protocol analysis, so looking at those who, who completed the intended four sessions, we saw a 17% difference in favour of ABM. So this meant that 64% compared to of, eight of the ABM patients compared to only 47% of controls had absolutely no alcohol at all during those first two weeks. Regarding the later outcomes, the group differences in favour of ABM were maintained at the three month follow up, but were lost by the six or 12 month follow up, by which time 80 to 85% of the sample had relapsed. Nonetheless, it meant we had replicated our pilot study finding that, that it does help prevent that early relapse. And since we did multiple follow ups, we were able to examine for the first time in the CB lit CBM literature how soon people relapse. And we use survival analysis to, to look at this. And this figure here shows the proportion of participants in each group that were still abstinent over time, blue being the controls and red the ABM group. And you can see that relapse was significantly delayed in the ABM group, occurring on a median of day 53 compared to a median of day 12 among controls. Another limitation of the literature is that it tends to only report rates of abstinence and at the 12 month follow up. Our data show that ABM also led to significantly greater reductions in the number of standard drinks that they were having, as well as the number of heavy drinking days relative to those baseline levels in the ABM group relative to controls at the three month follow up, but not at any other point, so not at the six or 12 month follow up. Whereas drinking days at the three month follow up uh, only approach significance. And encouragingly, we also saw significant group differences in the changes in approach bias. Figure on the left shows approach bias to alcohol cues, and there was a mean approach bias to alcohol cues in the ABM group pre-training, which shifted to a mean avoidance bias after training, and that's the purple line. And in controls, it remains a mean approach bias even after training, as you can see by the blue line. If you look at the figure on the right hand side, which is approach bias to non-alcohol cues, we actually saw, and this surprised us, we actually saw an almost a significant increase in approach bias to non-alcohol cues in the ABM group. And again, it was unchanged in the control group. We also asked participants to rate their craving from zero to 100 using a visual analog scale in response to the question, how strong is your craving right now? So from I don't want this at all to I really want this. And we got them to do this immediately before and immediately after each ABM session. And so the visual analog scale showed a reduction over time between session one and session four. However, as you can see from the figures, this occurred in both groups, showing a, suggesting a main effect of time. However, we did see a significant decrease in craving immediately after each training session in the ABM group and a non-significant increase in craving among controls. Finally, task ratings suggested there was high acceptability with 80% either agreeing or strongly agreeing that the task was interesting and that it improved their attention. Around 35 to 40% agreed or strongly agreed that it reduced their craving for alcohol. But I think the important thing to note here is that the results or the ratings were actually very similar across the ABM and control group, which gives us some confidence that blinding was maintained, or at least it wasn't obvious to, to controls that they were in the sham training control group. So what can we take away from this? Well, in conclusion, we were able to replicate our pilot trial. And since this time controls were exposed to the same alcohol and non-alcohol images, this gives us greater confidence that it's the approach avoidance training that confers that therapeutic benefit. In other words, it's more than exposure or extinction learning effects. The findings add further weight to the growing body of evidence that approach bias modification can prevent relapse. The fact that we failed to detect group differences at the six month or 12 month follow up suggests that four sessions delivered during detox may not be sufficient for lasting effects. And we may need to think about things like post detox booster sessions that could be delivered via the smartphone, for example, to, to extend those, those uh, initial gains. The trial generated some new evidence that the training impacts on other non-abstinence drinking outcomes, the so heavy drinking days and standard drinks at three months, 
We also have further evidence that it's possible to reduce approach bias through this form of training and some new evidence that it's possible to increase approach bias to, to non-alcohol cues. And this has opened up a new line of research for, for my research group, looking at whether we can personalize approach bias modification training, replacing those soft drinks or non-alcohol images with images that are aligned to the participants' goals or the patient's goals, healthy, positive images that will reinforce motivation for drinking less or abstaining. Despite this reduction in approach bias and um, reductions in relapse rates, there was no evidence of mediation. This didn't surprise us. It's only mediation effects have only been demonstrated in one of the ABM trials to date. And it likely reflects the, the poor measure of approach bias that we're using, the approach avoidance task, which had, I think, uh, had a Cronbach alpha of, of only 0.3 um, in our study. But this shouldn't deter us from using it because we are using approach bias modification because there's many examples where you know, we don't really fully understand the mechanism of treatments that are, that are offered. If you think about things like lithium, ECT, and even a camprosate. We were also able to reduce, to demonstrate a reduction in craving immediately after each training session. Uh, we are in the process of analyzing and, and writing up some, uh, some of the outcomes relating to other measures of craving and cure reactivity that we have in the training task. So if, you, if you're interested in finding out more about those, please do get in touch. In terms of limitations, I think the main one was that we were reliant on self-report due to the huge or vast geographical patchment of the four withdrawal units. It wasn't possible to get them back in to do a breathalyzer to verify self-reported abstinence. But given the, the task ratings suggesting approach bias modification during withdrawal treatment is acceptable and we've demonstrated that it's feasible, I think particularly in, in comparison to perhaps other more intensive cognitive training interventions, the fact that it's so safe, simple, low cost and requires minimal training and, and, and minimal equipment, we would, we would recommend it as an adjunctive treatment during inpatient withdrawal. And indeed, it was recently added to the revised National Alcohol Treatment Guidelines in Australia as a relapse, relapse prevention tool um, for people undergoing alcohol withdrawal. So that's it for today. And I'd like to end by acknowledging the incredible team I've had the pleasure of working with on this trial, the co-investigators and collaborators, the many researchers and students and the volunteers, to the clinical staff and participants, and of course the funders. And uh, thank you for listening. And if there's anything you'd like to, you would have asked if this were a live session or anything, you know, you want to know about the trial or, or just to chat about approach bias and modification, I'm always happy to do so and don't hesitate to get in touch. Thanks.